check me. With fire. Yes. Mm -hmm. Fire from heaven is always like that. Yeah. Okay? So there's always that. There's going to be a big storm. Mm -hmm. right? It was, it was one, of my, one of my moments when I thought, Moses, choose someone else to tell us when the hail stops. No, no, when I'm, I'll, I'll pray when I'm outside in the city. <laughs> now, he's busy killing livestock. Moses is not that big. If hell hits him, he's gone. He walks outside of the city, and then he goes, okay, I bet you can stop now. You see this growth in Moses the whole way through while God is busy revealing himself more and more. Okay? So he starts to set them free. And they leave, or they build up to the tenth plague. Tenth plague, specific point. <laughs> Death of the firstborn. God's really angry at firstborn people, and that's unfair. He killed children. Why? <laughs> right. We have the first. We have a problem. Not only is Pharaoh God, but also his son, seeing how Daddy acts, or will grow up thinking that he has that right. But also, God did all the firstborn belong to him. Only because that happened after. So he took them because of this plague. Also, the Egyptians killed all the firstborn of the year. Right. Kill all the babies, put them in the river. Right, Moses. Off you go, boy. And remember, God went and they were busy giving it to the Nile. The Nile was the lifeblood of Osiris. And then they also worship crocodiles, the great protector god of Pharaoh. Don't worry, they'll take care of it if Osiris doesn't do it. And they worshiped at the Nile. Egypt sitting at the waters. He's not having a bath, promise. It's worshipping. And God says, strike the water. Where's your God? He's dead. He's dead. He didn't get up again. Okay? And each one of the plagues, as he promised Abraham, I will take on the gods of that nation that holds your people captive. I'm sorry, Vince. I don't know if I missed it, but I still don't understand why Rosh Hashanah is considered the Pesach is in the beginning of the year. Because the Shemitah cycle, the sabbatical years, and the Jubilee here are counted from Yom Kippur. So every time there's a 50th year in Kippur, it's in the time of June. Right? It's, it's a strange cycle. Alright? It's just a cycle. It's just a cycle. Yeah, but it counts from time to time. So you have a biblical, physical calendar, and then you've got a different side to it as well. It's the same as when you look at these feasts. He's going from harvest to harvest to harvest. It's not a coincidence that those three harvests are the three pilgrimage festivals. Go up. Why do I go up? Because I'm taking first fruits. Yeah, but remember, you mustn't sit and say that it's a new year when the no, it's not. So it's what not I'm saying is, do you see the thing? Yeah, we see the cycle. You, you see, see the, the thing to me, we see the cycle. But there's a spiritual application to this, and this is a physical calendar. Mm -hmm. So we've got a physical calendar, we've got other things underlying. Yes. Okay. So, Pesach yeah. gets him out, and then all of a sudden there's blood, and there's a lamb, and there's a sign, and Nick's going to go into all of those exciting things. And then there's going to be unleavened bread. Why unleavened bread? You don't, you don't have time to let it rise. Eat the meal, gird it, staff in hand, get ready to leave sandals on your feet. There's no time. It's happened now. You're free. Snap. Death is passed over. Pharaoh throws you out. And off they go. And then they start going through this. First fruits. Stars up with your body and, and other things. No, no. And then we start getting to counting the Omer. Now, when you start looking into the counting the Omer, you need to know what, well, what's an Omer? It's a portion. It's a way to measure. And, they, and where do we get that reference from? What did they do when they picked up an Omer off? They used it for the manna. Everybody picked up an Omer full of manna. And it was enough. It's a standard. It was an all encompassing meal, a full. Protein full meal replacement. You did not need anything else except for God's manna. The bread that fell from heaven. It tasted like honey it was sweet in your mouth. Okay? You didn't need anything else. This would what be would be to sustain you. But when you look at it, do me a favor. You know what? I've got five minutes. How many of you in your Bibles have got those little uh, headings, subheadings and things like that at all? Alright. Go. Exodus 12 is where you're going to find the Pesach. Look at when they leave and look at all the interesting little places they stopped at. What happened in the time of the Omer? We're looking at 49 days. 
And on the 50th day, where are we here? What happened over here? To give us uh, two bookends? We were given the Torah. So we were there. Simon. 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 So between leaving Egypt from running, running, leaving like a troop to Sinai, God's trying to show me this part. What is the link? Shut what happened. Some big things happened there in between. We left Egypt, we walked out troop by troop, we got up to the place and then all of a sudden God said turn back and then he said no stop, go back to this place and then we popped off somewhere. They bought the golden calf. No, 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 golden calf happened after that. Red Sea crossing, right? God gets GPS miscalculation. Tells him to go down and then he tells him to go back and then he tells him to go and he pops him off in a place where they got nowhere else to run. Because they were going to go close to the Moabites and they were afraid that they would be running back to God knew that. They did not. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. That's why they... I'm giving you the Hebrew calculation problem. Do you want to go this way? Moses? By the way, Omer is equivalent to about 220 meters. Omer and Omer. Go the Emirates. We also did that once. Right? There they are. Not like this hungry Emirates. Right. So we continue. There we go. Right. So we start getting into interesting things. We've got the Red Sea crossing. They complain about food and water. Mm. Hey. They complain about food and water. Then, yeah. Mara. Mara. Then we go to? Elim. Okay? And then we get mana happening in this time. We get the first quails happening in this time. We get some interesting things that God does. And he's not trying to beat them, he's trying to get their attention, he's trying to teach them something. So let's just use these, these three quickly. Comes up and he brings them to a place that they cannot cross. What parts the waters? <laughs> ruach, a wind. A mighty wind that comes up. Ruach, Ruach, Hakodesh, the Holy Spirit. It's the same word. The Spirit parts the waters, lifts up the walls, and they walk through. There's lots of faith there, huh? Yeah. If they didn't see what they saw behind them, I don't think they would have walked through. <laughs> think about it. If you all of a sudden see a seat pass and there's wings holding this thing up and you're thinking, well, that's about 200 meters up fast can you run? <laughs> How long is that wind going to hold? Okay? Put yourself in their shoes for a minute. No. And then you've got this crazy old man, Moshe, with the stuff, and he goes, well, what are you waiting for? Let's move. Okay, then you go. You follow Moshe. Like wild wood. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit more. So they walk through and they pass through, and what happens after that? It says they pass through on dry, dry land. Now there's a nice difference here in the Hebrew. We don't see it so much in English. Because when the chariots, and, the chariots of Pharaoh and then come and they chase after, it says they got stuck. It was damp. So God already starts slowing them down. You wonder if no. already, the wheels were broken. The wheels were actually broken. That's why they couldn't move as well. Sticking in the mud and they could not get through. And of course, probably there might have been stones and things like that. But these guys are skilled charioteers. Okay? So it might have been a small channel. They come in, they run in, and then God says, dry ground for you. Don't worry, I'm going to slow you down. And at this point, we start thinking if God is really just messing with them. Run. And it leaves you enough that it's chasing enough that you can see them coming from behind you. Why didn't he open up the waters and let them pass you and then they could have waved at them from the other side of the bank? He's <laughs> teaching them to leave their old self behind. It's something that happens here. Okay? When they left Egypt, well, in Egypt they were what? I was in the final. A bunch of slaves. Slave mentality. Egyptian mentality. And that was the, probably the hardest thing that I might to deal with of trying to get Egypt out of them. Mm -hmm. Trying to show you that you're not who they said you were, you're something more than that. Mm -hmm. How am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to take you to a place that you can't cross. Then I'm going to part the waters through my Ruach and I'm going to bring you out to the other side. When they left, Scripture says they marched out troop by troop. They left like a conquering army, but they didn't even lift up a stick. 
It was only the tenth plate that they said you better put some land blood on the top of the doorpost because otherwise we're also going to get it. It was the only one that God required of them. You need to do your part now. I've come nine steps. Even more if you count Moses arguing at the burning bush and all the rest of it, setting up, keeping Moses safe, etc., etc. But you've seen nine ones. Do you trust me enough when I say death is coming? Or are you going to listen? I think by then he got the attention. And he gets him going and he pushes him through and they go through to the other side. When they get to the other side, the army rushes in. God says, water washes away. And all of a sudden, chariots and soldiers and then, oh God. But you know, once again, yeah, Pharaoh must have had a lot of, must have had a lot of cheek to look at the water raised and say, I am still God. After all of that, saying, I will hold the water up. Knowing that they had destruction, Egypt, why would it have destroyed them also? Yeah. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> so he, he goes off. And he gets to the other side and he sees that which was holding them in bondage gets washed away. Mm. And they get to see it. If they never saw it, how long do you think? Do you think, oh no, fear has gone around. Mm. That would have feared. He's going to come and get us again. Mm. How can I walk in peace and sit at the Father's feet if I'm worried about what's coming behind me the whole time? God knows how you think. So he's helping them deal with their stuff, getting them there. Okay? They come across and he brings them to after what I believe, to correct me if I'm wrong, three days walk. They start complaining, mm -hmm. no food, no water. But don't worry, you've got gold and jewels. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you've ever wanted until you realize you can't drink or eat any of it. <laughs> yeah, it's good, it? Right? Mm -hmm. Realizes, helps them understand. The stuff that you're longing for is not going to save you. No. It's not going to help you. To become like an Egyptian and be comfortable and have people serve you is not my end game for you. I will give you all the wealth in the world and I'll put you in a place where you can't spend a cent. <laughs> then he brings them out and he goes through the little waters of Mar. Mar in Hebrew is better. He comes out, he says to them, what, you can't drink this? What happens? <coughs> huh? No, Stick or a staff? Stop. By God's authority, I heal the waters. I make your bitterness sweet. sweet. I make your bondage a celebration. You celebrate Pesach, and what is the instruction that God gives you? When your sons ask of you, why do you celebrate this? Today, I brought you out of bondage. Not some random four or five thousand years ago, you. Because where would you be if I did not do this? You would still be in Egypt. You wouldn't know who I am. You wouldn't have the story to recount. You won't have any of it. And so he starts to build. Teaches them that through his authority, he's going to heal waters. He's going to put them right. He's going to make his bitterness sweet. And he takes them to Elim. Elim means? Sweet water. No. Wisdom. No. Wisdom. The whole essence of wisdom. And there they find what? Twelve springs and seventy dead palms. Right? Springs of water. Speak to me. What is he trying to tell him? Living waters. You're in the desert. Trust me. It's the difference between life and death. If you miss it, you're gone. Right? Why twelve? Why not thirteen? Why not fifteen times? For each one of the tribe. I'm going to make you springs of living water. It was amazing that Abraham dug and he wells of living. He dug wells and he got living water. He gave people water and he got to give them testimony. How do you keep on doing this, Abraham? I don't, I don't get it. You dig three, you eat three. This is amazing. Now, you know, let me talk to you about my God a little bit. And he slowly but surely, they start to see the fruit of what he's doing and what he and what he has, and he's giving the glory back to the Father. So he comes up and he goes, all right, I'm going to make you like springs of living water. There should be ringing New Testament bells for you guys big time. All right? And 70 date palms. Date palm, which is upright, being righteous. Tallest domestic tree we have in Israel. They say, may you be, a, may you be righteous like a date palm. Okay? A sadiq. Upright. But a date 
can also be used for something else. Ani, date honey. The land flowing with milk and honey wasn't just about the bees. Okay, they take the honey, they boil it, it creates this, or they take the dates, they boil it, it creates like a syrup, they call it date honey, very sweet. What does that tell you about God? May your word be sweet in my mouth. May you be upright and righteous. Why 70? Four shed of the Senate. Four shed of the was going to be a council of people. Four shed of the God created a council of 70 leaders, puts them together, and he says, You will help them guide Israel. It was Moses pointed by himself. Question. Yes, sir. If the Lord had said that you would live 70 years, would it not also link into that that for all of your life? That's a nice application, yes. That's something we can look at. Awesome, thank you. All right, so maybe it's a full life of being upright. In the word of being upright. 70 nations in Also, could have been an application, but you want to bring righteousness to the nations. Okay, they were light unto the world. Okay, so they have jobs to do. Sorry, regarding the 70 years, I think that, that scripture has been. There's one day. Yeah, but um, I, I recall some, just go check it. I think it actually says you know, will be 70. Right. It says a life full of days is three score and ten. Yeah, Anything over like, than that is blessing. You can <laughs> beg So it's it's yeah, it's like if you if you yeah, it's a gift. If you if you get to live to seventy. Are you talking about a time when most guys didn't make a post fifty? And then you get the really old boys like uh, take a minute. There's another seventy I'm thinking of. Yeshua also had a, a, a sort of a lesser disciple of seventy people that he sent out to do some seventy there. Again, coming into a Sanhedrin hall. Yeah. Okay, it's funny that Israel today in the Knesset has 70 minutes mm -hmm. based on what the, what happened here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there will be wisdom. You will be living water. You will be upright. You will bring forth fruit. This is what I want to make you. But I got to heal your bitterness in your heart first mm -hmm. to get you ready for this. And on the way, he starts to prepare them and starts to reveal more and more who he wants to be to them. Is this making sense? Yeah. Okay, let's fast forward a little quickly to New Testament times. I'm not going to go into that. Okay, that's his job. All right, talk a little bit about our map. There was a conversation with Nicodemus. And what does God tell him? Unless someone is born again, he goes, How can you enter into your mother's womb? I mean, come on, dude, what are you talking about? Stop being cryptic and spell it out. It says, Unless you are born of water and of? Spirit. Sure. Ooh, change the idea of who you are. You are not slaves to sin. You are not stuck in bondage. Mitzrayim, Egypt, means bondage. That's not who you are. I saved you, I'm bringing you out, and I want you to be free. Awesome. Free to do what? Free to follow. Free to follow. I'm going to tell you your bitterness, who you were, all your hurts. I'm going to take all that away. I'm going to heal you from the inside by the authority, the staff, that comes from God. Wisdom. Righteousness. If you drink of the spring, rivers of living water will come out and flow from you. You will become that spring in a desert. You will not that by bread alone. Not only Torah, but Messiah is Torah. And he's slowly but surely talking about this stuff in the backdrop, building up to pass up in crucifixion. Okay, if you want to do a nice little parallel with the plates, look at the miracles that happened before. And you will find I am the Messiah. I can distinguish between who's my people and who's not. And he does miracles that no one else has ever done. I have no equal. And he's all building up to that one point. That is a lamp. Go and do a study. It is interesting that the big miracles, the blind man from birth was all set up there right at the end because he wants to show them, guys, you've seen prophets before me, but no one ever has done this. Okay? So he builds up. Gets them to, and he makes this link of, if you want life, take an omer full. 
you start to simulate, it's not just about a nomad full of stuff. Mikvah, baptized, be healed, become wisdom, eat of me. And when you do, then you get your shovel. Have I lost anybody? All right. Shavuot, what happens? Torah first. Covenant. This covenant comes down and he gives him a sign. Let's get to about this wedding contract. A sign and symbol of Shabbat. And who writes on the tablets? The Ruach. In our Bibles it says the finger of God. That's a Hebraic Indian. For the spirit wow. right so the holy spirit writes the, the, the ten commandments or the decalogue the ten words which we know is just headings of a whole bunch of other stuff that torah talk about right mm. okay you want to talk about idols there are sections in torah that talk about idols mm. they go together okay and we have this wedding contract what would normally happen why do we have two stone tablets so, treaties. so it's a normal covenant one copy for you one copy for me Right. Okay, so I have a copy, you have a copy. What would normally happen in a normal everyday scenario? You and I enter into government, what happens? We we'll both keep copies and if one goes astray, we, we can reference our own copy or make them reference their copy. Right. So we've got our contract and if our sons, sons forget about what we agreed about, we've got it written in stone. It does not change. I've got daddy's signature at the bottom here. Your father signed it. Guys, come on, here we are. You have to adhere to this thing. And we put it there and we keep it. But God does something crazy. He doesn't take his copy that we sign and he takes it up into heaven and he goes, yeah, next time you guys forget, here's my ammo. <laughs> what does he do? He lies. No. <laughs> Build a tent. <laughs> a mishkan. A place of meeting. A holy house. There's, lots, there's like three different names to this place. And then he goes in and he says, Build the Ark of the Covenant. And you stick it in there. And where I rest my feet, that bad boy is going to be right up by daddy's leg. And if you think you can walk in there and steal my contract, you've got another thing coming. But the problem is he doesn't just keep his one. He takes both. Listen to the heart of the Father with us. He comes down. He talks to a nation. He enters into this wedding contract. Tells them to build a marriage tent. And he puts it in the safest place in the house. And then he says, uh -huh. where I go, you're coming. I don't want to be separate from you anymore. I don't want to have to go talk to Moses to go get my people. I want you to be with me. I want you to walk with me. I want you to love me. I want you to understand. I didn't save you and put you, bring you here all through this point so that you can just go get promise I made to Abraham and give you some land. I did all this so I could get you to love me. Amen. Torah is a gift to a redeemed people. It is not just an obligational contract. It is a gift which gives life. What is life? God. So he brings you to himself and he says, sit. Amen. He says, I want you to remember this. Why? Because I'm going to walk with you. There's a cloud by day, fire by night. And think about that for a second. Any of you been to oh, wow. Israel in summer? Yes. Yeah, nice name. Yeah, you don't need cloud. You're, you're desperate for winter. You need a cloud. <laughs> Not all of us have just. <laughs> I'm special. All right. You go over there. Tanya and I had the, had the fortune and misfortune of making this mistake once. It was honeymoon. Go to a live. Mm. Nice. Nice. Very lovely. Nice, nice. Put it there in the midst of it. Don't worry. Good South African mentality. We'll go walk you at about four. Sunsets at nine. Four is like 12 o'clock. When you're walking around and it feels like someone's got a, a hair dryer on full blast and it's shining in your eyes. And that's just the air outside. <laughs> Cloud by day is a really, really nice thing. <laughs> you need it. You will not be able to. It was literally, you would get up, you would go snorkel, you would come and you would find a place where you can go hide for the next 
10 hours of the day, and then you would come up again at 7, when it was nice and cool like 34. <laughs> it was 48 degrees. It's not comfortable. <laughs> right? These guys walked in the wilderness. <laughs> Look at your timelines. This is around March, April. 50 days later. Yeah. In the desert, having a wonderful time. And then, well, let's carry on walking a little bit. In the desert, you freeze to desert now. So a little bit of fire is not a bad thing. These were just awesome symbols of, look who I am. He's literally keeping them alive. So he saved them to bring them unto himself, to betroth them. And this was a big thing, guys, I really need to hear this. Their sole intention was to get out of Egypt. Once they were out, they realized that the covenant was made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob was true. So there was a promised land that they were going to go to. Hallelujah, we're going to the promised land. I have my wealth, I'm going to go buy a piece of land, and I'm going to go live my dream. And if it was up to them, they would have ran right past Sinai, and they would have bolted into that land, and they would have just become Canaan. God stops them from running. You can't run far if you don't have food and water. So you learn to sit at His feet. You learn to rely on Him. You learn to move when He moves. And when He gets you to that place, but He says, no, 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 before you get the promise, you've got to have me. Brings them to Sinai, gets their hearts. Well, some of them say it. And He goes, now that we're together, we can go into that land and we can show the world who you serve. This place is pivotal, but we would have missed it. We would have ran headlong straight in. Like some of us might not have left Egypt. All we wanted was a pay raise and some better working conditions. We don't like the consequences of sin. We don't mind the sin that much. It's the consequences we have. You know what I'm talking about? When God reminds you that you're running from Him and He decides to put your back out for three days so you can't move. Or your toe. Or your toe. Or He gives you a, blind, a blinding migraine. And you go, oh, just this is terrible. How? How, how, can, how can he do this? Oh, but you need to take this away from me. He says, but if I don't chop you up now, you're gone down the road. I need you to slow down. That I realize that I gave you strength to serve me, not to work on this. Not to go and be God to yourself. And he gets them out. And he gets them betrothed. And then they start walking along. Make a noise. Okay. Why? Oh, don't worry, you'll understand later. Mm -hmm. These are what we call the, the unfulfilled or feasts that are still going to be given more meaning later. Mm -hmm. When he starts to come and he starts to do some cool things. Yom Kippur. Coming in where God gives you an opportunity once a year. Once a year to wipe the slave king. Why? How many of you like running around apologizing to everybody you've offended? <laughs> no? It's not a, not a big thing for you? That hope you growl back on the way here because he cut you off? <laughs> so I'm having a bad morning. Do we stop at all? You offend your brethren? You offend your family? Now let me equate this to you from heaven's perspective. I 